Well, welcome firefighters and safety inspectors. This module, this is the 11th lesson for those taking Chem 105. The other module 11 is those taking Chem 100. So if you're in 105, this is the one to watch. Of course, Chem 100, you're welcome to listen to this one as long as you Chem 105ers can listen about drugs. But uh, this, this section is for Chem 105 and the other section is for Chem 100. So the 11th lesson now, we're going to talk about toxicology and hazardous materials. And the general idea, maybe you've heard, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. That's not entirely true. A lot of times, what doesn't kill you will make you worse. So let's talk about toxicology. Uh, toxicology, something that's toxic, it causes harm to a biological system. So that's what toxic means, causes harm to a biological system. A poison, poison is a toxin of biological origin. So that's the difference. A poison is toxin, but not all toxins are poisons, if you go by the logic. Now let's talk about LD and LD50 and LC50. So the LD50 is the amount, the lethal dose that, and typically you get units of milligrams per kilogram, the milligrams of the dose per kilogram of whatever animal you're looking at, kills half of the exposed animals. And LC50 is the lethal concentration uh, that will kill 50% of the population. Threshold limit value, this is the upper limit that someone is allowed to be exposed to. So these are some of the things you read about in MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets. So here are the LD50s of some substances, and you take something like sucrose, and this is uh, table sugar, and you can, the LD50 is 29,700 milligrams per kilogram. So that means for, or 29 grams per kilogram, that means for a, um, a 100 kilogram person, that means that person can, uh, can consume about 3 kilograms of sugar. Uh, 3 kilograms of sugar, that's, that's over, um, that's close to 7 pounds of sugar. So that means a 100 kilogram person, which is about 220 pound person, has to consume about seven pounds of sugar to, uh, to have about a 50% chance of dying. That's, that's a lot of sugar. So sugar is not really that toxic. Now you go on the other bottom, botulism, botulism toxin, you're talking of a really, really small amount here. So 0 0.00000002 milligrams uh, per kilogram. So that means a 100 pound person needs a little little bit of botulum to to um, get a lethal dose so you can see that uh, up there things like sucrose sodium chloride and alcohol these are not really that toxic but then on the bottom you have ricin and botulum these are a little tiny bit can kill someone so that's the smaller the LD50 value the more toxic something is so how do you get exposed to toxic substances Inhalation. Inhalation is one through the lungs. Um, so gases and aerosols, you breathe this way. Uh, ingestion, oh, another word with inhalation. Um, for inhalation, a dust mask does not protect you from inhalation of certain things. Dust masks will only protect you from things like uh, asbestos and, and uh, certain particulates. They do not protect against solvent exposure, for instance. Uh, ingestion, this is, this is through the mouth, this is how toxins in food are absorbed. Dermal contact, so through the skin, so if you get something on your, on your skin and it harms you. Uh, not really, this is injection, that's when something is put directly in the bloodstream. Oftentimes it's grouped with dermal, to dermal contact. The, uh, the safety of the chemicals, so the Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, instituted in 1970, the, um, the limits for these. And uh, acute, acute means short term, and uh, and there's different definitions for for how long a short term is. This in general is less than 24 hours, is an acute exposure. Chronic exposure, this is long term. This is three months or longer, is the chronic thing. So how do we measure these? The maximal allowable concentration, the MAK, at at any given time, and this is typically in units of parts per million ppm. Immediate danger to life and health is IDLH, and PEL is permissible exposure limit, so that if you're working around it, that's how much you're allowed to be exposed to. 
So let's talk about the different types of poisons. Corrosive poisons, these work by destroying tissues, like your skin. Your skin is a tissue, so corrosive poisons, especially on your skin. And these work by breaking proteins. So we're animals, we get our, we get our structure from proteins. Uh, strong acids and strong bases have are corrosive poisons. They, have, they typically have very low LD50 values. And I know two people that have had to go to the hospital because they've put... Um, uh, pipettes on their mouths and sucked on them and ended up swallowing some of the stuff. So don't put your mouth on pipettes. Uh, halogen gases, these tend to be corrosive poisons. These can also cause something called pulmonary edema where your lungs fill with fluid and you drown in the fluid. Hydrogen peroxide is one, as are many oxidizing and reducing agents are corrosive poisons. And many also fit in more than one category as well. Metabolic poisons, these interfere with normal metabolic processes. So cyanide and carbon monoxide are examples. So uh, these both work uh, by um, keeping your body from uh, absorbing oxygen. You're, you're, they bond to your hemoglobin stronger than oxygen does. And uh, they, um, they both work by causing suffocation. Uh, cyanide you can treat with thiosulfate. Carbon monoxide you need oxygen. Both of these must be done quickly though for people who are exposed. The nice thing about cyanide poisoning and carbon monoxide poisoning, more so cyanide, if you can stand up and walk away, you're fine. Um, toxic metals, we use many metals in our society. Pollution of these metals cause harm. Most of the, um, the, the uh, toxicity of these metals come from deactivating enzymes, inhibiting their activity. So the addition of mercury to certain enzyme, mercury is a, is a neurotoxin, it deactivates the enzymes, then your, your brain doesn't work as well. Some other really toxic metals are beryllium, chromium, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, tellurium, and lead. So these, these are some bad ones. There are more. I mean, plutonium is another example, but there, there are some more. Arsenic, uh, some rocks have it, and uh, the problem is, is that it, by mining can release these, and this is especially found true in, in India. Um, Arsenic can also be used in pesticides and chemical agents, so like uh, uh, British, um, uh, but Lewisite, the, uh, the chemical weapon employed by the British has it in it. Uh, it's also found in persistent pesticides. This, this is a carcinogen, causes bladder cancer. On the right here is a rock that has uh, arsenic in it. Uh, mercury, in general, mercury and mer mercury metal, mercury salts are not very dangerous, but uh, they if you absorb the, um, the uh, organometallic mercury, that can cause terrible damage, as does mercury vapor. And uh, maybe you've heard the phrase, mad as a hatter. The hatters all went mad. Mad's not angry, it's, it's crazy. The, uh, the British word for crazy is, is mad, the slang. Abraham Lincoln is believed to have had mercury poisoning. Maybe Abraham Lincoln had mercury poisoning there. Um, and or organic mercury compounds, there these um, have led to bioaccumulation in fish. So the uh, predatory fish have more mercury in them from from bioaccumulation. Lead. Uh, this is the most widely distributed of all toxic metals. So we use it quite a bit. It's in car batteries, uh, lead soldering, plumbing. Uh, original plumbing was lead. Uh, some ceramics, crystal, crystal glasses. Some paints have lead in them. And uh, it's toxic to the, to the central nervous system, and it also inhibits um, hemoglobin production. This is especially dangerous to children. It can cause mental retardation in children. Uh, and in general, adults can excrete about two milligrams of lead, children less. So children are the, the I mean, it's poisonous to adults too, but children are a little bit more susceptible. Cadmium is another one. There's a picture of cadmium on the right. Uh, it replaces uh, calcium in the bones, making them brittle. And it can lead to what's called the ouch-ouch disease. It just means like if you, if you hit your bone on something, if you bang your arm against the wall, you might get a little crack in your arm. So they, you'll be in a lot of pain if you get the ouch-ouch disease. It causes other really kind of bad feelings, a choking sensation, vomiting, diarrhea. Not a, not a fun toxic, toxicity to have happen to you. Uh, how does metal poisoning treated? Keel eating agents are used. So uh, British anti-lewisite and EDTA. EDTA is ethylene diamine tetraacetate or tetraacetic acid. These are used um, to get rid of the metals. They, their chelates are called claws. 
So if you have a metal ion, the killing agent grabs onto it and it brings it away. This is how you get rid of soap scum. So certain products, I, I cleaned my shower last week using this stuff. I had lots of soap scum. And so I sprayed some, uh, some soap agents that had EDTA in them and it, it grabbed the calcium and magnesium ions out of the, uh, out of the wall and, got, and cleaned it up very nicely actually. And neurons, we're talking about neurotoxins, so let's talk about neurons. Neurons are nerve cells and uh, they're electrical signals. So um, the, the, uh, there's the dendrites on the top of the nerve cell, and I'm looking at the picture here, and the nucleus in the top there, and the signal will travel along the axon and then go to the nerve endings, and then the, um, the nerve endings, the, the signal will travel between the synapses, the area between the cells, to the ending, to the receptor of the other nerve cell. And uh, a very common nerve neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine tells your, your body to move. So uh, the signal goes from my brain, from the left side of my brain, to my spinal cord, then to my hand, telling my right hand to contract here. And the signal for motion is acetylcholine does that. Now uh, with, with um, the acetylcholine is turned into acetic acid and choline by the enzyme choline esterase. So if the enzyme that doesn't there that that um, that that that's not there to to create that, then uh, the the signal after I close my hand, then my muscles, all of these along my arm will start to to seize up from that um, from the acetylcholine going through. And that's what neurotoxins do. So what I that I described in detail, that's how the nerve gases work. They inhibit choline esterases, so talbum, sarin, uh, nerve gases. Uh, organophosphates, those are things like RAID. Those are also used to, um, they, they're neurotoxins and they're, they're more toxic to um, insects than us, but they're still pretty toxic to us. Uh, you can block receptor sites, so surface anesthetics can do that. Well, they are believed to actually dissolve the area between the nerve cells. Nicotine can also do that. And uh, blocking the synthesis of acetylcholine, that's what botulism toxin does. Uh, liver, the liver is the organ that detoxifies our body. And it's often done by oxidation reduction reactions or by coupling reactions. So for instance, benzene is converted to phenol and then peed out. Uh, the problem is, is that um, a lot of times when the toxin is oxidized, it goes through, uh, it can become um, dangerous. Uh, so alcohol poisoning is not caused by alcohol, it's actually caused by acid aldehyde. That's the intermediate step between alcohol uh, to, to acetic acid. And then, uh, but of course, in, in the small amounts, alcohol is turned into carbon dioxide and water. Uh, and I talk about coupling reactions, that's how you get rid of things like benzene to create phenol. And other types of toxins, teratogens, so teratogen, this is a Greek rooted word for, for monster. The terra is the monster. So teratogens are chemicals that make monsters and makes birth defects. So makes babies be born with um, deficiencies. And a common one uh, that was used in 1960 was thalidomide. Thalidomide was a sleeping pill. And uh, it was not allowed to be uh, distributed in the United States and actually it was to our great benefit. It caused uh, children to be born without arms and legs. Um, alcohol and cigarette smoke are also teratogens. Alcohol can cause fetal alcohol syndrome and cigarette smoke tends to have children with lower birth weight. Birth weight. Mutagens, what mutagens do is they mutate or change DNA. And this can cause certain mutations like a different amino acid sequence, which can lead to things like sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, or cystic fibrosis. Uh, sodium nitrite uh, turns to nitrous acid. It's a mutagen. It makes, it's added to things like baloney to make it look pink. So that's, that's actually a uh, mutagen. Also, tris has been banned. Uh, another note with mutagen, they're also all carcinogens. Uh, so before I talk about carcinogens, let's talk about cancer. Two types of tuners, malignant or benign. A malignant a benign is the, the good one to have. They grow slowly or not at all or slightly shrink, and they don't spread. 
malignant, they grow quickly and they spread quickly. So if I have cancer in my brain, uh, the cancer is going to grow quickly and start putting pressure on the other areas of my brain. And carcinogens, uh, these are chemicals that cause cancer over a long period of time. These are acute, or these are chronic conditions. And uh, we believe cancer is caused by a normal cell becoming an, an abnormal cell, and then that cancer cell, then that cell is promoted to a cancer cell. So that is how cancer is believed to have been, to, that's how carcinogens cause cancer. So what causes cancer? Uh, big ones are tobacco and obesity. There are other ones too, as you can see, but the big two there, if you don't want to get cancer, the easiest way is to, to avoid obesity and avoid tobacco. So I'm going to talk about chemical weapons a little bit. These were used in war field to, to kill or incapacitate the enemy. Used quite extensively during World War I, and chlorine gas, phosgene gas, and mustard gas were, were used. Uh, we have modern agents. These are nerve gases like sarin and tobin nerve gas. These are weapons of mass destruction, and their use right now are prohibited in warfare. This is a poem by Wilfred Owen. Let me read it to you. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we, crudged, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep, many lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot, all went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping s softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys! an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In my, all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If some smothering dreams you two could pace, behind the wagon we flung him in, and watched the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, to get here at every jolt the blood come gargling from froth-corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend you would not tell with such high zest, to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decora mes pro patri mori. So this poem is about warfare in World War I, these talking about the uh, the chemical weapons that that Wilfred Owen uh, experienced in the trenches in World War One. He unfortunately didn't make it to the end of the world. He was killed. He uh, although he wrote his this poem. Uh, hazardous materials. These uh, have de been decided by the United States Department of Transportation to uh, being capable of posing an unreasonable risk to health, safety, and property. And these different hazard cat classes, uh, so we know what to store with what and how and what type of things to do in emergency response. Because, for instance, some of them, you do if they're on fire, you do not want to put water on them. So this is a quick understanding of the danger for anyone involved. And here are the hazard classes. I'll show you the, um, the hazard classes, except for flammable solids. I'm not going to show you the placard for that, but I'll show you the plastic placards for the other ones. The first one is explosive. So explosive is an exploding sphere. So uh, if there's some sort of danger, you can see what that is. Uh, gases, and there's different types. There's flammable gases, compressed gases, and some poisonous gases. Uh, flammable solids, uh, these, these can be combustible. These can be dangerous when wet. Uh, oxidizers, oxygen peroxides, for instance, are, um, can be dangerous here don't want to mix an oxidizer next to a fuel, for instance, something flammable. Poisonous or infectious materials, these have the, uh, the skull and crossbones, you can have other things like toxic, harmful, infectious or inhalation hazard. Uh, radioactive, you have this black trifoil, typically with yellow. Mostly you see low level radioactive waste. High level, they're usually, you won't see them, they, they, these will, will tend to be contained more and probably go under armed guard. Um, high level reactive waste, these are things like nuclear weapons or waste coming directly from the core of a nuclear reactor. 
most most things are low level radioactive waste corrosive materials you have this the hand or bar kind of uh, corroding away the um, these acids and bases oxidizers can also be corrosive also strong reducing agents can be miscellaneous things that don't fit in really any sort of category can be thrown on the miscellaneous sort of of um, uh, placard so hazardous material management so in general philosophy, and I have this philosophy in my lab as well, minimize the contact. So minimize the contact, that's the best way to get rid of it. Uh, also, have a system in place. Ignoring hazardous materials doesn't make the problems go away because cleanups are really quite costly for hazardous materials. Education with that, uh, we have some federal standards with that. We have rules and regulations. Also, you as a worker, when you work somewhere, you have the right to know uh, the employers are required to tell you uh, what you're working with and what the hazards are. And uh, as part of being a new employee, for me, when I was hired at this job, I was trained on how to deal with hazardous materials. Likewise, when, uh, when new employees are hired or when I take on student aides, I need to, uh, to train them with uh, hazardous materials. And I have, to, I have to continue my training, actually. The education included MSDS material safety data sheets, uh, written hazard communication programs, so chemical hygiene plan, for instance, is something that I have. We uh, carry lists of hazard materials. I, have, I hold a chemical inventory. Uh, other other um, institutions are required to have this as well. And labeling, things may be labeled because a lot of things look like water. Uh, chemical hygiene plan, uh, we have one of these, who's responsible, the name of the person, and how things are stored. So you store them differently for each hazard class. So, for instance, sodium metal, which explodes upon contact with water, that's not something you want to put by the sink. We have a separate cabin cabinet that I uh, keep my sodium in. Uh, also, standard operation procedures, or SOPs, these tell you what to do. Uh, these, these written rules are to let people know how to perform certain functions. This is in case someone leaves and you have a replacement, someone knows exactly what to do to not put uh, other people in danger. A safety plan, this is important to have. It's important to have a plan. And this is uh, for anything from evacuation for fire, uh, but also for a work environment. So all these procedures, what to do during a fire, what to do uh, during, uh, we have lockdown procedures on campus, for instance, and that we have all these in, in place. Enforce the rules. That's why I go around my lab and make sure that students are all wearing safety glasses. We need to enforce the rules. And um, uh, emergency procedure plan, have some mitigating things, first aid kit, uh, me medical uh, kit, these type of things. Uh, also, incident report. Unfortunately, accidents and things do happen, but it's important to learn from those mistakes. And we've learned from many different mistakes. So what an emergency plan do you have? What to do in case of a fire? What to do in case of a medical emergency? Natural disaster like earthquake, hurricane, or uh, tsunami. And then people problems, things like uh, that would constitute a lockdown. Uh, record keeping, we help to follow our risks like chemicals and, ass and assess them. And then if we make mistakes, to learn from them, to learn from these types of behaviors. What resources does one have for, for hazardous materials management? Well, there's the MSDS sheets. The Department of Transportation requires these. Uh, the, the, um, also, you can call the manufacturers, ask the manufacturers about uh, the different hazards. There are several um, compilations of these. The Merck Index, for one, all these types of things. The Threshold Limit Values, NOISH, U.S. Department of Transportation, NFPA, all these types of resources are there available for you so that you can help understand the risks. There are also, uh, there's different uh, regulations. There's federal regulations, state regulations, and local, and sometimes they're different. So uh, depending on where you're at, uh, they don't always uh, align. Uh, handbooks are available. Workshops, I've been to workshops on this. You're taking courses. This is one of the courses. This course is a resource and meetings. Um, my committee, we meet once a semester, the safety committee on, on my campus, talk about these things. Network with some experts, so uh, education helps you here networking, so if 
You can call me up if you have any issues or questions I could help you with. And you get your own library. I, I, keep, uh, I personally have a stack of MSDS sheets. Uh, well, I actually have three books full of MSDS sheets of all the uh, MSDSs, that, of all the chemicals I have in my laboratory, for instance. Um, now let's talk about waste disposal. We generate uh, chemical waste, and we need to dispose of it. So unfortunately, uh, many places have been contaminated, and uh, they're still contaminated. In general, there's three types of waste. There's solid hazardous waste, or solid waste, hazardous, and reactive. So solid waste, this is rubbish. This is the stuff you throw away uh, in your, in your uh, trash can, you have you, you, they, they pick up. Hazardous waste, this is a further category that uh, it's a little bit more soft than solid waste. It's more than just wads of paper and food waste. That's solid waste. Radioactive waste, this is a special category from nuclear power plants, nuclear weapons, or hospital radionucleotides. Let's talk about hazardous waste for a little bit. These can cause excessive harm to humans and the environment. Uh, paper towels are not hazardous waste, but something like uh, a gallon drum of pesticides, that's hazardous waste. And uh, they can be elicited by ignitability, so gasoline is a hazardous waste. That could burn, as could motor oil. Corrosive, corrosivity, re reactivity, or toxicity. So all these things, all these types of chemicals can have these things. Uh, and a lot of these wastes, the ignitable wastes pose fire hazards. Uh, a corrosive waste, this is a, cor a corrosive waste is something that has a pH less than 2 or greater than 12.5. Some reactive wastes can explode, uh, like, um, like picaric acid or something like that, or, or gunpowder, uh, and or can form toxic acids, like cyanides. Uh, toxic wastes can cause other issues to the groundwater, so things like chromium salts in the groundwater. So what's the source of hazardous waste? Industry produces quite a bit, about 300 million tons per year. And how do we get rid of that? So first idea, minimize them. So new processes. This is an aim of green chemistry, is to minimize waste. Also recycling waste. Certain streams that come from plants could actually be used somewhere else. And uh, you can convert some waste to a non-hazardous form. So how can you do that? Um, for instance, incinerate it, burning it, and then scrubbing it. Or treating it, for instance, turn hexavalent chromium, which is car carcinogen, to trivalent chromium, which is not toxic. Bioremediation, that's when you add plants or something to help uh, uh, to rehabilitate the area. Also isolation. So you isolate it and you store it forever so that nothing ever gets in contact with it. So certain landfills, that's one of the things I do with my chemical waste, is I send it to a secure landfill in the mainland. So, so perpetual storage, and I, I, I just told you that's what I do. Secure landfill, that's, where I get, that's how I get rid of my waste that I can't treat myself. Another way is deep well injection. Put something really, really, really far down underneath the, underneath the ground. And then surface impoundment. You can put it in, a, in a, a very dilute amount in large volumes of water. So radioactive waste. So we have high level waste, uh, low level waste. Uh, nuclear bombs, uh, these are high level waste. Uh, spent fuel rods from nuclear power plant. These are really highly concentrated radioactivity. Low level waste, these are things like the gloves, the glasses from nuclear power plants. The, um, the, the walls of the nuclear power plants, some medical waste, these types of things are low-level waste. Uh, we store them. The weapons and um, most, uh, most of the waste comes from nuclear weapons or nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear weapons especially. We've made, uh, us in America, we've made over 30,000 nuclear devices. So we have quite a bit of radioactive waste here. And right now, um, the government takes care of that. Nuclear power plants, they keep uh, all of their waste on site.